The Commissioner's Court of Brassie County will meet in regular session on June the 6th, 10 a.m. the Commissioner's Courtroom in the County Administration Building, 200 South Texas Avenue, Suite 106. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the invocation of the uh, Pledge of Allegiance to the U.S. and Texas flag. Mr. Connell will lead us. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you give us each day and for our health, our, our salvation, our love of you, our knowledge of you. 
and the ability to serve you in what we do. Bless us in that effort that we might give you glory in pursuing truth and sticking to your will. Bless this nation to do the same and all of its members, all of this globe to give you glory through the way that we treat each other. And bless Brazos County, especially right now in this time, this time in our country where we face challenges and uh, I ask you to watch over those that care for us, our soldiers, our law enforcement, police, fire, and just all those that serve to keep one another safe, that they, we are free to do your will. Yes. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Number two is call for citizens' input and or concerns. Uh, if you hear Amy Cahill. Good morning. Last week we presented on the Greenleaf Lane and the general counsel made the following statement that the end of the cul-de-sac is where the county accepted maintenance. He also said the best case scenario for them is that we have a public right-of-way, not a road, dedicated by a developer that gets you to the center of the creek. The county judge also said that it was never accepted by the county. Last week I showed how the, when the, uh, on May 31st, 1888, the county accepted all roads in the Rustico subdivision. An end of maintenance sign was placed at the uh, measured location right here at the end of where there's an iron stake. Uh, 2001 county road list also lists uh, 1,069 feet as the length of Greenleaf Lane. In 2005, the road list changes to be just 1,042 feet and the maintenance sign at some point was moved from here to here. <coughs> uh, we also have work records from that time where the county placed standard base on this gravel section of Greenleaf Lane. Maintenance records only go back five years, so this is the first documented evidence of county activity on this road that we have eyewitness accounts of others. Then in 2018, November 5th, that's where I got involved on this road. I'm married, I'm living on this road where I grew up. My husband was working to coordinate the neighbors in an effort to address the maintenance on the private road section of Greenleaf. Uh, as he looked into possible solution for that culvert section, um, uh, let's see, he noticed the Brazos CAD property map seemed to indicate the culverts were actually part of the county section of Greenleaf. So he approached the county and the road and bridge department at that time. The county engineer said they would look into it, and the next day, 84 yards of standard base was spread on this gravel section of Greenleaf up to the maintenance sign here at 1,042 feet. This is documented in the work order system. The county then hired Strong Survey, I guess a couple weeks later, to locate the edge of the subdivision and resolve the questions on how much of Greenleaf was County Road. Based on those survey findings, the county maintenance site was moved back to its original position at 1,069 feet. The county engineer um, informed the residents via email that the county was responsible for Greenleaf up to that point and would again take responsibility for the culvert crossing. We're like, great, problem solved. Three weeks later, there was a flooding event out there and we called the county and they responded by taking the sign and moving it to here. We're like, what? Um, when we uh, checked in, we were instructed to take our concerns to county legal department. When we asked the legal department what information they had consulted to put the sign back in a location it had never been before, they were told no information had been consulted and this is where the sign should be. They were told if we could show evidence the sign should be in another place, then the location would be reconsidered. So basically, we had a sign that for seven years was here, for 23 years was here, then it was moved back here for about three weeks, and then moved all the way to a new location. We do not see the logic behind the current location of the sign, and so we ask that the sign be moved back to its original location next to the iron pin at 1,069 feet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brian Cahill? Good morning, Brian Cahill from Greenleaf Lane. Um, last week, the general counsel made the following statements. He said that two pieces of property, 
the other side here, uh, were conveyed to the center of the creek in their meets and bounds surveys. So we're going to look at the warranty deeds for those properties. So starting with the one right here, we pull up the warranty deed from 1990. It states, beginning at the half-inch iron rod, found marked to the east corner of the 10.57 acre tract described in the Highland Interest Parks Survey, Bishop Bradford County Records, same being the center line of the edge of Greenleaf Lane at the edge of the Rustic Oak subdivision, according to the plat recorded in volume 897. So this, this plat here starts its entire survey right there. So it says a physical iron stake in the center line of the Greenleaf, sub, Greenleaf right of way on the edge of the Rustic Oak subdivision. If you look at the plat for this, or the warranty survey for that one, it starts in a different location but passes through there. It says, past the south or southwest corner of Lot 15, Block 2, at the west corner of Greenleaf Lane right of way, as platted in Volume 897. Same being the north corner of the proposed 30 foot right of access easement. Continue for a total of 161.89 feet to a half inch iron rod set at the center line of the intersection of said Greenleaf Lane. So both of these warranty documents here reference a half inch iron rod in the center of Greenleaf Lane at the edge of Rustic Oak subdivision. So a physical location on the ground. Dr. Lyle's opinion is that it's intended as described in the final plat of Rustic Oaks and the adjoining plats to hold the iron pin as the boundary. He, all, he goes on to say, the iron pin set and found is the boundary of the Rustic Oaks subdivision and the tracks to the south and concludes ownership of all roads and assets in the subdivision. So the county argument that the warranty deeds of the adjacent properties conveyed to the center of the creek doesn't match the facts listed in the documents themselves. And Dr. Lyle's analysis of the situation confirms that the center of the creek is not the center right here. So a question we'd ask the county is why, why is the county debating the location of that center of the creek when they're also saying they're responsible for nothing past here? Um, we're going to ask if the county would deny the opinion of Dr. Lyle that they would present an official opinion of some sort saying, here's another surveyor who says, I've got a, a conflicting opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, James Jones. <coughs> Thank you for letting me speak again. Last week I gave information about uh, uh, maintaining the culverts uh, on Greenlee and the, uh, the county uh, council came up, the general council came up and refuted that saying, quote, the county has never installed or maintained those culverts. There is no record of that at all. Uh, I was present when that culvert was maintained one time because the county main uh, road grader went across it and caved it in. And so they had to come in when they were doing their maintenance, the county maintainer went across it, caved it in, they had to bring in a load of materials, and I had to wait until they got it spread out before I could go on home. Well, um, in 2019, four of us neighbors, four people who live on Green Greenleaf, met with the general counsel the county engineer and the two road, county road supervisors. I recognized one of those supervisors and asked him in front of this group of people if he remembered having to fix that culvert and uh, because of the sinkhole that they had caved in. And so he affirmed that and he acknowledged it and he said yes. And so we have evidence that the county was maintaining those culverts and that they, uh, and that was in a meeting in which eight or so people were in attendance. Dr. Patricia Nason was the first resident out on the private portion of Greenleaf. And she remembers, we, we contacted her. She, she moved away from there in 94, but we contacted her and she remembers the bridge flooding over and having to walk across through the water to get home. But that then the county came out and put new material back on top of the culverts and fixed it. So these are two incidents that we have eyewitnesses to. Well, it is true that the county did not install the culverts, it is also true that the county did not build anything in the subdivision. The culverts that they had to replace on Rustic Oaks Drive, they didn't put those in, but they had to maintain them because they were roads that were under county maintenance. Um, <clears throat> so while the, uh, this was back in 1988 when that was accepted. So the fact that they did not build it does not negate their responsibility to maintain it. Uh, the statement that they did not ever maintain it is simply not true. Uh, while the county having a policy to purge all maintenance records that are older than five years, uh, we would ask that the county, or we would ask the county, 
How are you going to prove that you never maintained it? We have eyewitness accounts to the contrary. Thank you. Anna Jones. Thank you. My name is Ann Jones and I've been a resident on Greenleaf Lane since 1992. And today I would like to answer a couple of the objections that have been raised about our petition to have the county repair the culvert crossing on the county maintained portion of our street. One objection that was made uh, by the general counsel was that the developer put in a second set of culverts. This quote, those culverts were put in by the developer. They washed out in the past. The developer put them back in the second time. The first question that we could ask is, do we have some documentation um, records uh, on which this statement is based? And the second question would be, when did this happen? If it happened before the county accepted the roads in 1988, then it's ir irrelevant because the county accepted them in their current condition. But if it happened after the county accepted the roads, then the county should enforce the Brazos County Regulations for Construction of Driveways and Easements. It says this, uh, the area between a private property line and the property line across the road is called the county right-of-way. Because the right-of-way is Brazos County property, a driveway, sidewalk, mailbox, or any other structure built or located within that right-of-way would be a trespass. So in summary, any changes made before the county accepted the road would have no bearing on this situation. And any ch uh, changes that were made after the county accepted the road, uh, they would have the option of addressing the developer for trespassing on their land. Regardless, the county is responsible to maintain a dedicated and accepted section of Greenleaf. Is the county being asked to grant an exception or to give a special treatment? Although the county claims that by fixing the Greenleaf culverts, they would be making an exception and setting a bad precedent, this is really not the case. We have demonstrated that the county owns the public section of, and the culvert crossing based on these three pieces of evidence. Number one, the county records of acceptance. Number two, the iron surveying state. And number three, previous maintenance. The residents are fully aware of our responsibility to maintain the private section of Greenlee, and we are only asking that the county maintain the dedicated, accepted, and previously maintained public section of Greenlee. Our concern is not to increase our property values. They increase dramatically each year anyway, and we will still live on a privately maintained gravel road. Our concern is that delayed maintenance is causing this county-owned culvert crossing to become unsafe, especially to unsuspecting drivers, uh, like the sanitation workers recently, and to the tax-paying residents of our street who may one day need emergency services. Thank you for your time and your attention to this matter. Thank you. Uh, Lori Cook. Hello, my name is Lori Cook, and this is my daughter, Alexa. And I want to thank Commissioner Condorla for asking God to help us pursue truth, which is what we are trying to do in this matter. Um, we live on Greenleaf Lane. I'm here to address a statement that was made last week that there's a reference to the fact that the creek moved a little bit. We've also heard this comment in another county meeting where a statement was made that maybe the residents moved the culverts. To address this, let's look at some facts. The culverts pictured here are surrounded by a concrete bulkhead that is 26 and a half feet long, six feet tall, and 80, eight inches thick. You can see Alexa standing here on the six foot wide concrete pad that extends on the ground past the bulkheads on both sides. This current structure is not movable. This structure was in place when residents moved onto the road in 1991. In addition to this, there is a large post oak tree 18 feet from the iron property boundary stake between the stake and the creek. The tree has a diameter of 27 inches. Based on a growth factor of three, the tree is approximately 81 years old. The base of this tree is eight feet above the base of the creek. Currently, the distance from the property stake to this location, to the center of the creek, is 38 feet. If the iron stake was originally in the center of the creek, that would imply the creek moved between when the plant was made in 1986 and when the residents arrived in 1991. It would also require a change of the creek location by 38 feet, thus a calculated move with heavy equipment involved, not a minor trajectory change. And a move would mean this 81-year-old tree was originally in the center of the creek and its base was eight feet lower than it is today. 
Why would the county make a statement that the creek might have moved? Could it be because they realized that the iron rod is truly the edge of the subdivision? Based on the above information, the idea that the creek moved is not plausible. If the county is going to use this as a reason not to take <coughs> responsibility for this section of road, they should provide some documentation to back up the statement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Charlotte Hamter. Hi. Uh, my name is Charlotte Hamter, and I'm a 23-year resident of Greenleaf Lane. I'm here to talk about private road versus county road. Uh, I'm a realtor by profession, and in my line of work, opinion just doesn't mean squat. Uh, the only thing that matters in real estate law is the cold, hard facts. Just the facts. So let's look at the facts. Last week, general counsel was quoted as saying, it is not only illegal, it is a crime to use county resources on pro private property, end of quote. Then the county judge was quoted as saying, if a county employee on a maintainer decided on their own, out of the goodness of their heart, that they were going to push rock, it would have been an illegal act because that was not county maintained property. I can tell you, this happened years ago while I was still a commissioner and that employee, when a neighbor said, you will you know, fix the driveway, uh, it was turned over to the district attorney and that employee was terminated and I believe prosecuted. If someone was doing some maintenance past where we should have been, it would be an illegal act for them to do it, end of quote. So here are cold hard facts. Official county maintenance records are only retained for five years. However, we had the following information based on an open records request in 2019. We found that in 2015, eight yards of standard base was delivered to the site in question. Seven hours of labor was charged to the county and multiple pieces of equipment were brought to the site in question. Then in 2018, 84 yards of standard base was delivered to the site in question. 35 hours of labor was charged to the county and multiple pieces of large equipment were brought to the site in question. So the cold hard facts make it preposterous to think that one county employee out of the goodness of his heart could do all the work mentioned and none of his superiors were ever made aware of it. Was there ever any action taken against those who authorized and completed maintenance of this section of Greenleaf Lane? The cold hard fact that no one is being charged would lead to the conclusion that it was a lawfully maintained county road. So for as long as I have been a resident, the section in question has been maintained by not one rogue county employee out of the goodness of his heart, but instead by the Brazos County Maintenance Department as a whole. Their commissioners is absolutely <coughs> no way. 60 plus residents of Greenleaf Lane would waste this court's time asking for county funds to be illegally spent maintaining a private road. We are asking you to read Dr. Stacy Lyle's report. It's an expert report, who out of the goodness of his heart, without any monetary compensation whatsoever, spent countless hours reviewing the evidence and concluded that this section of road in question is in fact the responsibility of the Brazos County Maintenance Department. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen Van Gogh. <clears throat> Good morning. I am also here representing the residents of Greenleaf Lane, and I will be addressing a comment that was made at last week's meeting. The following was said. I know that the people of this community feel like the county has been working hard to keep from helping them, and that is actually wrong. When this first came back in my area, that was 2017. I and the other attorney that I work with spent a good deal of time trying to figure out a way that we could do something about this road. Unfortunately, even with the information you have heard this morning, everything across the creek is private. Want folks to know we have spent hours and hours to help them. It's a bad situation. We all agree on that. As a response to this, I want to acknowledge what the county has done for us. 
They have met with us on a number of occasions and provided reasons similar to those given previously for why they have no obligations. They have been courteous and professional. They have indicated that grants were an option, that they cannot assist in the process, but could provide a support, supporting letter. They have been cooperative with us on open records requests, and the county clerk's office has been extremely helpful with research. And they have spent time researching the matter internally. So while the county has helped in a number of ways, they are blocking our efforts in two ways. But before I mention those, I want to highlight a statement that was made last week. Everything across the creek is private. That is something we can all agree on. The property beyond the creek is privately maintained by the residents of Greenleaf Lane, and we are not asking the county <coughs> to take responsibility for that. But we are asking that the county fulfill their obligation to maintain the public portion of Greenleaf Lane, which includes the culverts and gravel portion of the road toward the paved cul-de-sac. Our research has shown the culverts to be on public land. Now to return to the two ways the county has blocked our efforts. Primarily, they claim that the culverts are on private land, which has the following implications. Our ARP funds request was classified as private and then was dropped by the commissioners. Our commissioner has said that he has resources to assist with grant writing, but cannot use them until ownership is established. If we apply for grants on our own, the county would attempt to block any grants we apply for that are for use on public land. Secondarily, they have refused to have an impartial discussion on the subject. <clears throat> they have not addressed Dr. Lyle's survey and opinion. The other research we have presented is either not addressed or dis dismissed as irrelevant. They will not provide documentation for their claims. They have claimed to have researched the matter on their end, <clears throat> but have not provided us with any records to support their position, while we have continued to answer their objections with more and more research. In conclusion, I want to thank you for listening to us today and ask that you take the time to consider what you have heard from each of us, as well as take the time to review our presented documentation. <clears throat> I believe that if each of you look at our research, you will see a problem that does have a clear solution that you most definitely can be a part of. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, the citizen input. We will move to number three is a presentation and discussion. Presentation by Chad Capitan, uh, County Administrator, County Extension Agent, Ag Natural Resources to Commissioner Chuck Condola on successfully completing Commissioner's Court Leadership Academy, Section 1. Chad. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to just read a short uh, presentation, if I may. Um, to the commit community members of Brazos County and the Brazos County Commissioner's Court. For more than 50 years, the V.G. Young Institute of County Government has served local governments in Texas. Since 2005, the Institute, a part of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, has offered the Commissioner's Court Leadership Academy, or CCLA, to further enhance the professionalism, broaden the knowledge, and enrich the experience of county judges and commissioners in Texas. CCLA involves four sessions over a two-year period, a three three-day sessions in Texas counties and one seven-day session in Washington, D.C. Presentations, workshops, discussions, and networking opportunities during the sessions guide participants through complex leadership topics. Topics are carefully selected and developed to be timely and relevant to county judges and commissioners. On behalf of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and the Brazos County Extension Office, we congratulate Mr. Chuck Condola on successfully completing Commissioner's Court Leadership Academy Session 1. Sincerely, the Brazos County Extension staff and the B.G. Young Institute, <coughs> Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Chad, thank you. Thank you very much. Need to do a picture down there. Do we need to really? Chad. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we ought to stand. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Okay, we will. Judge, if I may, uh, I'd like to extend congratulations, yeah. and I think I speak on behalf of uh, uh, Commissioner Barry as well as members of uh, Class 9. We're very proud that you were a uh, a uh, member of class 10 and uh, hope that you enjoy the entire program just as much as we did and find it to be uh, just as good for you and your abilities to be able to serve the citizens of Brazos County. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate that, Steve. Uh, yeah. I will say ditto, ditto to that and uh, a, a big thank you to the Yang Extension and VG Young. They do a great job. No question. That's that's for sure. VG Young Institute Ag Extension as that team is top notch and yeah. this uh, course I expected it to be <clears throat> beneficial to my role as commissioner, but just uh, for the, the small amount and, and I don't need a reward for each step, uh, but for the small <clears throat> amount I've done, uh, it was it was fantastic. Very eye opening. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a good program. I was in class two. Kenny Mallard, former commissioner, was in class one. Uh, that was back when Rick Avery was the uh, head of that program, and it was a good program then. I'm sure it's just as good now. So. Yeah. Thank you all. Congratulations. Thank you, Wanda. Um, we will consider and take action on agenda items 4 through 21. Number four is a request from Human Resources for the approval to accept the monetary donation in the amount of $250 for insurers <coughs> of Texas for the health and safety expo on June 15, 2023. Move approval. Second. Motion made second the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None motion carries. Number five is a request from Human Resources for the approval to accept $7,048.59 from TAC uh, RMP employees safety equipment program funds will be maybe used for on road and bridge and facilities employee safety move approval second that's made second in discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed that motion carries number six is approval of the following job description compensation and benefits analyst uh, human resources 2080 hours code uh, bo118 move for approval Second. Motion made second. Discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Motion carries. Number seven is request from information technology for the approval of interlocal agreement between Brazos County and City of Bryan, DBA, Bryan, Texas Utilities for design construction for an underground fiber conduct system. This is required for BTU pole removal and courthouse fiber reroute projects. Move for approval. Second. second. Motion made second to discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. None motion carried. I believe uh, Mr. Caldwell might have had a comment that he wanted to make. Good morning, Judge, Commissioners. Eric Caldwell, Chief Information Officer for Brazos County. I just wanted to make sure that, that you were aware that this interlocal agreement with BTU gives them the green light to go ahead and start constructing the conduits uh, in which we're going to be pulling our, our fiber. Um, it, it's a necessary first step before they can pull down all of the poles along William Joe Bryan. But I wanted to make sure that you're, you're concretely clear that this portion uh, of that effort at $39,000 four hundred ninety dollars that that's just a a piece of the bigger project total and so I have turned in a capital improvements uh, request for the entire project including that thirty nine thousand but the grand total price is a hundred and fifty three seven fifty and so by giving BTU the green light go ahead and start this work and pulling down their poles I want to make sure that y'all are clear that in effect, we're obligating ourselves to, to doing the entire capital improvements project, the entire 153 750. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Did we take a vote on that? 
Yes. It did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number eight is request from the auditor's office for the approval of write-off accounts receivable FY 2020 is as uncollectible in the amount of one hundred thirty-four thousand two hundred forty-five dollars sixty-three cents. Move approval. Second. Motion made. Second. Discussion. Yes. No. Um, it's a shame that they they have left town. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I think from the information we received is is the entity. Uh, Rock Prairie Behavioral Health is now uh, defunct, out of business, has no assets as to which we can uh, have claim. This is a uh, property tax, back property tax. Um, it's the local participant provider fund. Oh, LPPF fund. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which. Gotcha. Me and Bruce can argue all day. I think it's a tax. I don't know if he does. <clears throat> <laughs> Um, but yeah, they they we haven't been able to collect. Okay, and this is LPPF money then. Yeah, right. this isn't Brazos County tax money. This is money that they should have paid to that LPPF. To the F fund, LPPF. Got and they failed to do it, and now they're gone. Yep. Yes. Very good. Well, okay. thank thank you. Okay. Thank you for making There's that distinction. There's nothing to attach the debt to. Okay. Let's explain that. Okay. okay. Very good. Thanks. Uh, did we vote on that? Not yet. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And motion carries. Number nine is approval of contract 23-129 residential services, juvenile offenders, and therapeutic family uh, life. Approval. Second. Motion made. Seconded. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Number 10 is approval of contract 23-131. For open records management software with just FOIA. Move approval. <clears throat> second. Motion made seconded. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? None. Motion carries. Number 11 is approval of contract 23 132 for primary internet connection services with Frontier. Move approval. Second. Motion made seconded. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And motion carries. Number 12 is consider to take action on Bryan, Texas Utilities permit to lay 140 feet underground line within the county right of way of Kathy Fleming Road, uh, located one mile west of FM 159, sites located precinct one. Move approval. Second. second. Motion made second. Any discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And motion carries. Number 13 is considered to take action on Bright Texas utility permit to lay 90 feet underground electric line. Uh, the county right of way of Wilcox Lane, located 1,283 feet northeast of FM 974, sites located in precinct 2. The move for approval. Second. Motion made second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries. Number 14 is approval of final plat. Of Hollow Heights lots 56R and 58R being a replat of Hollow Heights lot 56 through 59, uh, 3.689 acres, Thomas M. Splain Survey A53, City of Bryan, ETJ, Brass County, Texas, Sites located in Precinct 2. Move for approval. Second. Motion made second to discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carries. Number 15 is tax refund application for the following. Move approval A through D. Second. Motion made. Second. <coughs> discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries. Number 16 is commissioner's court minutes for the following dates. Uh, Move for approval vote. A through F. Second. Motion made. Second to approve A through F. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None motion carries. Number 17, budget amendments. FY 22-23 budget amendments 35.01 through 35.06. Move for approval. Second. Motion made seconded. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None motion carries. Number 18 is personnel change status. Move approval A and B. Second. Motion made. Seconded. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries. Number 19 is payment of claims. Claims to be paid by Brazos County. Claim number 
8122604 through claim number 8122708 and claim number 9007680 through claim number 9007749. Approval. Second. Motion made. Second to discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Motion carries. We will skip down to number 22 in the acknowledgement of the FY 22-23 budget to actuals by fund as of May 31st, 2023 and an acknowledgement of FY 22-23 contingency budget to actuals as of May 31st, 2023. Number 23 is Juvenile Director's Report on in, uh, Detention Population. Good morning, Judge and Commissioners. Uh, we currently have 40 juveniles in detention, 30 males, 10 females, and we have 28 juveniles on electronic monitor. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, 24, Sheriff's Report on Inmate Population. Sheriff. Good morning, Judge. Commissioners, 724 this morning. 618 men, 106 women, and 61 on electronic monitoring. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Uh, 25 is announcement of interest items of possible future agenda topics. I would just like to say a couple of things. Uh, looking at our employments, I'd like to uh, say congratulations to Juvenile Services for the number of people who are on there who are uh, new juvenile services detention folks it's great to get those positions filled thank you also wanted to uh, congratulate uh, so uh, on uh, what i heard was a very uh, uh, good uh, job fair that uh, they held and hopefully we'll see those uh, follow through thank you all for uh, your efforts and working on that and i also wanted to uh, bring attention and recognize that uh, the 100 Club uh, recognized uh, Sergeant Ray with Sheriff's Office uh, as Officer of the Year. And uh, for her uh, efforts being wounded uh, in pursuit and maintaining her composure, uh, wonderful that we have those types of people working on our behalf in Brazos County. So please convey mine, I think, our uh, appreciation and congratulations to Sergeant Ray. Any other announcement of interest items or possible future agenda topics? Hearing none, number 26, call for citizens' input and our concerns. We didn't have anything turned in. We will move back up and convene an executive session pursuant to the following. Uh, Texas Government Code 551.074 to discuss the appointment, employment, evaluation, and our duties of general manager position of Expo Complex uh, Brazos Valley Fair. Uh, and, and then following a Texas Government Code 551.074 to discuss the appointment, employment, evaluation, or duties of the veteran service office, officer position. And then uh, Texas Government Code 551.0725 to deliberate business and financial issues related to a contract being negotiated. And now it's contract A. Do we want to do this in two separate? Okay, then uh, D is uh, Texas Government Code 551.0725 to deliberate business and financial issues related to a contract being negotiated, contract B. And Judge, I've submitted two letters uh, on those two contracts indicating that it would be detrimental to the county's position to uh, not be able to speak in private about a publicly uh, a contract with an outside entity. Okay, so I'll need a motion and a second to approve that. And so moved. Second. Motion made seconded. Uh, no further discussion. All in favor, raise your right hand. So it's unanimous. So that's requirement of it. All right, um, we will need, um, for the first two, we'll certainly need uh, the court, and Aubrey and Jennifer. Is, I can't remember, was there? The attorneys. I beg your pardon? The attorneys. Oh yes, certainly, yeah, the attorneys. I don't remember anybody else. And then we'll call back in on the, the I think maybe Charles and uh, budget and uh, at alter. 
for this for the two contracts. But potentially Kim, since you worked on yes, this. Yes. So we'll catch these first two first, and then then we'll call those in. And the time is ten forty two. Uh, we're back out of executive session. The time is 12.09 and there was no action to take. Uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>